We're going to start with hymn number 321 in your green hymn books. Hymn number 321, and we have to stand up for this one. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. The prime is royal banner, it must not suffer. verse 8 is where we'll start. And uh, I, have a, I have another rock I'm going to pass around. Susan and I were down by Cincinnati the other day uh, digging in the dirt. And Susan turned this out, and I've been gluing it together and cleaning it a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a fossil that we found down uh, with Telemann Park, is what it's called, Susan? Fossil Park? Or Tremel. Tremel Fossil Park near Cincinnati. And uh, uh, I've been trying to figure out what this thing is. At first I thought maybe it was a sponge, but as I've looked it over, I think it's probably not a sponge. Uh, might be some sort of coral that uh, was back here in Ohio years ago. And uh, we're going to be talking about the age of the earth and fossils and some of those kinds of things a little bit uh, coming up when we hit Genesis chapter 5. So that'll be coming up. It'll be after I get back from vacation. As you know, we're going to be out of town for a few weeks. But uh, I'll pass that around so you can look at it. If you know what it is, tell me. Okay, because I haven't figured it out. It looks like a turtle. Well, if you look at it closer, I think you'll agree it's not a turtle. I see the neck and the leg. It looks like a turtle. Yeah, I think it's... Oh, yeah, the neck, yeah. So uh, have a look at that. And let's start by having somebody read for us verses 8 through, eight through 13. 8 through 13 in Genesis chapter 3. Do we have a volunteer? And he heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I hear thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because
because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? As thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So here, here we go. They've discovered uh, this change in themselves after eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now God is coming to visit them in the garden. So let's go back there to verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Um, apparently the presence of God caused something that they could hear. Uh, when it says cool of the day, that's, that's kind of an odd expression. You wonder what it might mean. And, and uh, the word there for cool, that they translate cool, is literally the word for wind in the Hebrew. It's literally the word for wind. And you may have observed this when you're outside and, and the sun starts to set. One of the things that happens is, of course, the things get cooler. But as the sun sets, the wind will pick up, and it'll start to blow. And that's what this expression, cool of the day, means. It means they're at the end of the day with the sunset, and that wind picking up to blow. So this is, this is the setting. It's end of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. We talked last week about the hiding and why they were hiding themselves that way. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. We talked last time about this issue of shame a sense of shame that Adam and Eve have because of their their nakedness. And they had not realized this before they eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 11. And, and notice that what's happened with Adam. He was afraid. Afraid of God. Think about that. How near a bond it was between God and Adam before the fall. How did, how did God create Adam according to Genesis chapter 2? What did he do? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. He creates him in his image, so he shares that holiness and righteousness of God by that image of God. But he physically does something to create and form Adam. Go ahead, Brian. He creates him out of dust, right? It's, it's like God's kneeling in the, in the soil of the earth and pulling together the soil. And then it says that he breathes into him the breath of life and the man becomes a living soul. Now think about that, the nearness of God in Adam. And God spends time talking with Adam, teaching him how to live in the garden. He gives him certain rules and expectations. Uh, he, he operates on Adam, doesn't he? How does he create the woman? Takes, takes the rib or side of, of Adam and from that creates Eve. So, so they, they have the, a very close bond. It, it, would be, it would be similar to the, the parent-child relationship, wouldn't it? The closeness of God and Adam. And now, after the fall, Adam is afraid of God. Afraid of God. To, to such a point that he'll hide himself from God's presence. What a change has come with the fall into sin. And we'll see all of that unfolding as we go forward. Verse 11. The Lord says, who told you that you were naked? 
And the answer is, no, nobody told them, right? <laughs> nobody told them. They realized it after they ate the fruit. They realized this after they ate. And then God asks right away, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? God already knew that. God already knew that. <laughs> God knows, doesn't he? God knows what's going on. You wonder why he, why he bothered to try to hide. Why Adam bothered to try? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did he really think he could hide? But, you know, yeah. that all comes with the shame thing, I guess. Yeah. When our kids do something wrong, they go and hide behind the couch or something, don't they? Yeah. Do they think that we'll never find them? <laughs> go ahead, Sherry. Um, after, we touched on this last week. Yeah. That he was going to fall, knowing that he was going to fall into sin. Why would he do that? Yeah. Are, are we not answering the question that God wanted the companionship, mm. but because the angels had that war before man was even created, mm. that created an evil. So God had to give them a good and a bad in a comparison mm. so they could distinguish between good and bad and then use that as his discipline ages down the road mm. and also to make way for Jesus. Mm. I mean, he wanted the companionship, but unfortunately Satan and his angels fell without fall. So God had to set yeah. the scenario, kind of set a scenario. I mean, I don't know, mm. that's kind of overthinking things. But that, that, that's all right. You're working through, through in your mind. You're kind of exploring. The yeah. was already there, so he had to give them mm. this thing because everything yeah. was Mm. The good and the evil. Okay. Give them the okay. Um, think about this as you think about why God went ahead and created them anyway, even though that He knew this was going to happen. Um, I would bet that our parents in the room, before you had your kids, <laughs> you knew that things were going to go wrong, didn't you? You knew the kids were going to make mistakes. You knew that the kids were going to, maybe at times, drive you up a wall, right? <laughs> and make, make, uh, make it life difficult for you. And yet you still decided to go and ha ahead and have those children, didn't you? You still went ahead and did it. Yeah, Mike. I think parents uh, that have children at an older age, uh, kind of realize that they're, they should expect something like that. But their younger people, uh, in their late teens, early 20s perhaps, okay. don't really have a clue mm. until they have their children and then they have these responsibilities and situations that come up. Mm. And yeah, they don't realize how difficult it might become, do yes, they? Yeah. They don't realize that. Yeah. yeah. I would guess that most, even even the younger parents, realize that it's not going to be a perfect existence. Not going to be, no. There's yeah. No challenges. Yeah, and still they go ahead and have and have the children. And and, and what 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 drives that? Why does why does a parent do that? Love. Love. Good, Diane. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the same kind of motivation we can attribute to God. Why does God create us? Love. It's the love of God unfolding in our lives. Imperfect as they are, the love of God brings that fruit forward. So, yeah, in, interesting thoughts, Sherry. Interesting thoughts about about the, the fall of the angels, when it happens exactly, we don't know. Uh, but whether that's related to God teaching them about good and evil through the tree or not, that's, 
It, the text doesn't tell us specifically, but it's not a bad thought either that, that God is trying to protect his children by teaching them. Um, yeah, I'll have to think some more about all of that. Okay? Any other comments or questions as we go here? So God asks Adam the question, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And, and how does Adam respond? Blame the woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, Lynn. Good. Let's look at precisely what Adam does. Does Adam deny what happened? He doesn't deny, does he? He's mature enough. He's mature enough to realize that he's done wrong. He acknowledges that before God, so there's confession of sin there. But it comes with some attachments, doesn't it? <laughs> the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. So there's, there's a clear, uh, blame it on the girl, blame it on the woman there, poor Mama Eve. Um, but uh, uh, how is, Lynn, how is God getting blamed in this? Okay, the woman you gave me, God. <laughs> the woman you gave me led me this way. So, so there he's, he, he is uh, making excuses, isn't he? No, he's trying to keep her around. God, man, and Eve. And Adam, he was both God and Eve. <laughs> Adam, Adam, this is not a way to create allies, is it, to blame everybody else? <laughs> well, that's what Adam does. This is precisely what Adam does. Um, yeah, and we saw, we saw earlier when, when Moses describes the setting of the fall into sin that Adam was with her. Adam was with her. Uh, it mentions that specifically. So Adam's not ignorant. He was watching all of this happen and, uh, and went along with it. Uh, let's see here. Verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? How, how does Eve respond? <laughs> okay. So she, she manages to find someone to blame too, doesn't she? she she's a quick study. She sees what Adam's done. <laughs> well, God didn't smack him yet, so I guess, I guess, uh, I guess making an excuse is going to work, and he goes right onto the serpent, or she goes right onto the serpent. Go ahead, Jim. She led him astray. Yeah. You think you think that's how it was? <laughs> did God, did God, God tell Adam what was right and wrong before the woman showed up? Uh, she was influencing him at this time. <laughs> but he allowed himself to be influenced, didn't he? Yeah. He knew better. He knew better, and yet he went along. So we can't lay everything at the feet of Eve here. That would not be fair. We can't even lay everything at the feet of the serpent, can we? Satan. Because Adam and Eve bought in, didn't they? They said yes. And they went along with this. Isn't this typical of human beings? This is just so... <laughs> what's say again? I, I think I think both pass the buck, right? Blame the other person. That is just so typical of who we are as people. It's what we do. Instead of take responsibility for for uh, for the life and uh, the mistakes that we make. Let's see. So the woman said, "The serpent deceived me." Did the serpent deceive Eve? Yes, he did. He lied to her. <laughs> he sold her a false uh, bill of goods, as we say. He lied to Eve, and she bought in. And doing it knowing what God had said. She, she chose to believe Satan over the word of God. You see how deep the danger is here. Go ahead, Brian. And the serpent replied with it because he had enough truth mixed in with his lies. Mm. 
Yeah, he starts out quoting God, doesn't he? It all sounds very pious. Uh, notice, uh, when you have a chance, go to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, we won't do that this morning, but, but look again at the temptation of Jesus, where Satan comes to Jesus to tempt him. And uh, you'll see Satan there quoting the Heavenly Father, quoting God. He knows his Bible. He knows it as well or better than any Christian. And he quotes the word of God to Jesus, trying to do the same thing that he did to Eve, to, to, to deceive. We have a wily enemy. Someone read for us, we've, we're getting a bit of poetry now. Someone read for us verses 14 and 15. Okay, so here uh, the Lord the Lord knows already the, the way of the serpent, right? There's already been this, uh, we, we saw from Revelation that uh, before this fall into sin of Adam and Eve, there was this war in heaven between uh, the angels and Satan gets thrown out. He knows Satan, he knows his ways, what he's like, Revelation chapter 12. And so he doesn't, he doesn't ask the serpent, why did you do this? <laughs> the same way he asks Adam and Eve, doesn't he? He asks them those kinds of questions, but he doesn't ask that of the serpent because he knows where, what Satan's up to. He knows what it's all about. So there's no opportunity to instruct Satan, right? God, God's acting like a, a teacher or a parent would here. Um, you know how when the kids do something wrong, you go into parent mode and you start asking them questions, don't you? Um, didn't I tell you not to jump off of the, uh, the swing when you're on the swing set? And the child has to say, yes. And then you say, did it hurt? <laughs> and they've got tears already in their eyes because they crashed, right? <laughs> you know the answers, in other words. You know the answers as a parent before you even ask the questions, but you do it for the benefit of the child. Same way with God here. He's asking Adam and Eve questions to get them thinking about what happened and the consequences of it, but he doesn't bother doing this with Satan because Satan's already condemned. Okay. Verse 14, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go. This is a, an expression of humiliation. Okay? On your belly. This is what you do to an enemy. And the dust you shall eat. All the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman. What's enmity here? Conflict. Fighting. Trouble. Okay, that's what enmity is here. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And then he says something different here. And between, what does the King James have? Thy seed and her seed. Uh, some of the modern translations will word it a little bit differently. They'll say offspring or something like that. Uh, it's talking about the descendants, isn't it? Uh, the interesting thing about the word there, though, is that the word seed is singular. It's singular. And St. Paul talks about this, I believe it's in the book of Galatians. And he says the seed that Moses, or that the Lord is telling about here to Adam and Eve, that seed points all the way down to a descendant of Adam and Eve named Jesus points forward to Jesus. That's the seed. And let's see what happens here between that seed and the serpent. Uh, there's going to be enmity between them, 
end of the verse there, he shall bruise your head. Okay, think of a serpent crawling on the dust. Bruise his head, right? Like stomping. And you shall bruise his heel. Okay? So the seed is going to be injured, and Satan is going to be injured. And I see hands coming up. I'm going to take Karen first, then Susan. Go ahead, Karen. Oh, I just, uh, in the study Bible, there was a section that was like a breakdown. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, first Adam, then he's the second Yes. And then, but I had thought of the cross as like a tree of life, but it's, you've got that beginning, and then Jesus closes it. Yeah. yeah. Perfects it. Yeah. yeah, for all the world, the cross looks like a tree of death, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what it looks like. It's a, it's a dead tree, it's a cut down tree, and it's a place of execution when Jesus is hung upon the cross, and yet we can say, because of what Jesus does there, that it becomes for us like that tree of life in the Garden of Eden that we've been reading about. It's going to give us life. If you look at, uh, I'll pull this back here for a second. This is the, uh, this is a cross we received from one of the mission churches that uh, we helped out over in the Ukraine. Uh, years ago and they gave this to us as a gift. It's a wooden carved cross And if you if you have a chance come up here and look real close and see what's down here at the base of the cross Okay, it's a symbol of death <laughs> But notice Jesus is above that Jesus is above that the, the cross becomes for us who understand it a symbol of life over death life overcoming death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, so yeah, and that's, that's the bruising that, that's going on here, Karen. That's, that's what's being talked about. Susan, you had something in your mind. So does Satan have offspring? Mm. Mm. We, we certainly read about uh, the, the New Testament scriptures refer to those who are evil as being children of the, the devil or children of the evil one. So, so in that respect, yes. In that respect, we would say yes. And when you think about what was happening on the cross, the people who had gathered and the way they treated Jesus, they were not acting like children of God, were they? No. <laughs> but, but I guess my question is, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, else, elsewhere in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells us that the angels don't have children. Right. Okay. So uh, they, 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 aren't, they don't marry. They're not given in marriage. Um, so I would say probably not. Yeah. There are some uh, horror films and stuff like that that, that yeah. try to go that way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's not in the Bible. That's, that stuff's not in the Bible. Go ahead, Joy. Well, I was thinking when she said, I thought, well, if he's a serpent, snake, a serpent is what we think of. Yeah. You know, how could he have offsprings that would be human? So, mm. Mm. I, you but, know, when she asked the question, my mind went that way. Yeah, but the, the, but yeah. the, serp, the serpent represents Satan, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. So how that worked out, whether, whether there's a... Uh, a serpent that he kind of embodies or whether he makes himself look like a serpent how he does that uh, revelation describes him as a dragon okay another reptile type description um yeah good good questions good questions but yeah the new testament describes children of the devil or children of the evil one and that's talking about those who practice evil and i suppose that might include the demons uh, we always have to remember that uh, that uh, when the Bible uses this family talk, 
it uses it in ways that we don't in English. They, they use family descriptions uh, to emphasize uh, different kinds of relationships. For example, um, I remember back during the Gulf Wars, uh, Saddam Hussein would always say that that conflict was going to be the mother of all wars. You remember this? So that's an example in the Near East how they use these family expressions to describe things. And that might be a part of what's going on here when it says, uh, when it says children, um, they can use that to mean disciples, followers. They, they, they use the word, the family words in ways that we perhaps don't in English. Uh, so uh, yeah, Lynn. Mm. You will do. Okay. Speaking of yes. Who going to crucify. So there's an example of this of this uh, family type description. Uh, they're not literally children of the devil. It's not like he got married and had children, but they're living a life like his, and so they're called the the children of of him. Yeah. Well. It Yeah. We'll have one or the other father, won't we? We'll have one or the other in eternity. That passage of which I spoke, wasn't it Jesus who said that? I believe so. To those who were going to crucify him. I don't know that it was at the crucifixion. I'd have to look it up to be sure, Lynn. I think it was a confrontation with the Pharisees that took place earlier. Um, I'd have to check that. But I think that might be when that happens. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Jerry. Yeah, this uh, will sound blasphemous, but why did God continue to go forward? You had the sin of Adam and Eve. Mm. Shortly thereafter, you had a murder between Cain and Abel. And following that, I mean, there was sin all along, but he, had, he basically wanted to wipe man and beast off the face of the earth. Mm. So they had a flood. Mm. Right, and following that was all kinds of sin and, mm. and death, and, and we're here today, mm. knowing some history of World War One, World War Two, mm. the Holocaust, and you just go on and go on and go on. Mm. If, if we're, I, I think we're predestined to a large extent. It, every God knows the answer to every question we're going to be asked, and He knows that outcome. Mm. And Regardless, we could sit here and say, well, we could make this decision that would save ourselves. God would know that, but he mm. also knows that people make decisions that put them in hell. Mm. So why does this just continue to go on? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Why, why, doesn't God, why didn't God end it right there? Why didn't they have the flood immediately? Or why didn't he just why get rid of Adam and Eve? Out. Why didn't he just and, and, and start, start with a different people? Uh, those those are questions we can ask. Um, I'm seeing hands here. Go ahead, Jim. You know, I often think that everything is going back to the Bible. Mm. Going back to the Amazon. Yeah. It started there. Look how many visitors are in the Middle East and all the way to the UK. Mm. Now everything is directed in that area. You know? Yeah, it's the it's the center of Africa, Asia, and Europe, isn't it? It's the largest land mass on earth, and Israel sits right at the middle of that, and so the trouble always seems to come back right to that spot, doesn't it? Always it seems, seems to be that way. Times, always. Know, but let's... Been tortured. I mean, the Jews. Yeah. But let's not forget Jerry's question here. I don't want to skip over Jerry's question. Let me try to summarize it. Why didn't God just end it there and start over rather than continue with Adam and Eve, with Noah and his family, and even with us. Why doesn't God just end it? Yeah. I think um, um, no matter what your children do, um, parents always forgive them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would that, good point, Kyung. I would point out to you, Jerry, the most commonly quoted passage in the Old Testament occurs again and again and again and again. 
Uh, I think the first time it shows up is Exodus 30, I want to say 34. The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I think this is an expression of the slowness to anger of God. And you'll find that those words quoted again and again throughout the Old Testament, that that's who God is. But that slowness only took us up to the flood. God, and God was done. Mm. Actually, he wanted to wipe everyone off the face of the yeah. earth. But he saves the family, doesn't he? Yeah. But he knows all these outcomes. He knows what's going to happen and even what happened to Noah and his family and his sons and their wives and everything just unravels. And he knows that. Mm. And I guess just for my own mm. personal thought on this is why does this go on. We see mm. this suffering, mm. death, and some people never ever experience the opportunity for yeah. Christianity. I have I have a thought I'm going to share, but I'm, I'm going to let Doreen comment. Um, he gave us free will. Okay. And we blew it a lot of times. Mm. And I mean, Adam and Eve blew it, so, you know. And we now struggle against a bound will, don't we? Because we're yeah. bound to sin. We're bound to go that direction, but but he did give them freedom at the start. I'll come back to you, Jerry. I thought I saw a hand. Ford Adams got the answer. Go ahead, Ford. I, I think it's because of the believers. He loves the believers, and therefore, uh, as long as, it, as someone believes, it'll go. Yeah. So, so uh, we're looking at the world, and we're seeing everything that goes wrong, all the terrible things happening. There is and. And, and we can't let ourselves be so overwhelmed by that that we fail to see the good things that are happening. Uh, I was going to ask you this, Jerry. Who's, whose birthday is it? Well, yesterday it was my wife's. All right. <laughs> Let's sing happy birthday to Judy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Judy. Happy birthday to you. So, <laughs> yeah. She, she doesn't always want to acknowledge that I'm her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and times like, why do you do that? <laughs> so, so, so along with the bad things that happen, there's good things happening, aren't there? There's good things. There's blessings, like celebrating Judy's, the gift of life that God has given Judy. We have things to celebrate as God's children. Even while we're mourning and shedding tears well, over the bad. Go ahead. On the line here, obviously. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's what troubles me. And I, and I heard the lady talk about free will. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's skewed, quite frankly, mm. that we do have free will. Mm. But God knows the outcome of our free will. Mm. He knows many of us will sin and never, ever get to heaven. Mm. At least that's my thought. Yeah. So you can have free will, but if that outcome is not going to be in favor of making the right choices, mm. so what? Yeah. Yeah. I I hesitate to use the word free will. Except. <laughs> I, <just> <laughs> I I use that expression free will for Adam and Eve before the fall into sin. They were truly free at that time. Uh, free will. You will look in your Bible to try to find this expression described as we use it in modern times, and you won't find it. Okay? You won't find it. Uh, it's actually a philosophy term. And it accurately describes Adam and Eve before the fall into sin. They were truly free and could have chosen good or evil. But after the fall into sin, we, we struggle with a bound will where we are bound to do and choose the wrong things. So this, this actually got blown up <laughs> when they went for that fruit. Um, you, in some translations, you'll find the expression free will, but it's, it's, it, it means this. Voluntary, like vol free will offerings. It'll mention in the Old Testament. It means voluntary offerings. But the human will is no longer free. It costs you your life, <laughs> your soul. It, if you 
take the wrong path. Yes. And and unless unless the Lord helps us to the right path, right. we're going to choose that wrong way, aren't oh, we? Definitely. We're going to go off. Yeah, we're going to go off. To the word of God, we're yeah. Not, we're not going to be around. That's right. We, that's that's the role that uh, the God's word has in our life to direct us to the right. Do you think he's uh, trying to get everything to come together and then maybe so far the stuff is not panning out like he wanted it to? He mm. knows what's going to happen. I understand mm. that. Mm. But he still wants it to all come together. Mm. And it doesn't look like it's going to yeah. happen. So therefore, I think he's going to end it one of these days. I don't know. That's it. Like that. Uh, there's a bunch of hands up. <laughs> the, more, the more we talk about this, the more hands go up. Um, uh, St. Peter writes in one of his letters that uh, the reason that the Lord has not come back and, and tied everything off and ended this is because he's waiting for people to repent. That that's the reason that he's doing this. I'm going to go to Tom, and then I'm going to come back over here to the peanut gallery. <laughs> You actually mean that's actually what I was going to. That's what you were going to quote from. The, yeah, it's it's in one of Peter's letters. I can't remember it's, if it's First Peter or Second Peter, that God's uh, God's waiting for people to repent, and to have have faith in Jesus. Go. Which one of you had your hand up first? Oh, I did. Jim, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. It did start over with the flood. It did start over with the flood. Jerry's pointed that out. Yeah, God started over with the flood, but then the same issues came back up, didn't they? Pretty quick, they came back up. Mike, you had your hand up. See, like with with predestined, being predestined and everything, mm. you know, I'm with Jerry. I've often thought along the same lines. What good is it? But he's given us all time to repent and come to him. Mm. But he already knows those that are going to and those that aren't. Yeah. So what good is that time? And he already knows that they're not going to. Mm. I've often wondered that. It's a, yeah. He, he knows the outcome. Yeah. And what he, good is that time? What good is this waiting period? So here's where faith you're not going to. Here's where faith comes in. He knows the outcome. And if he knows the outcome, then let's trust his plan. Yeah. I, that's where it all comes down. <laughs> okay. But you just question some certain things. It's, yeah. He we, already knows the answer. We, yeah, we want we want answers to things that we can't even begin to understand. Right. Yeah. It's it's beyond us, isn't yeah. it? I saw another hand back here. It's Lynn. There's a big word which I can't remember. But before the fall, we were created, Adam and Eve were created. They had a choice either to sin or not to sin. Yeah. That after they, they sin, then we are, and they were, unable not to sin. Yeah. Yeah, you're there's a, you're there's you're, a big word. you're trying to take me back to my seminary years, and it's been a few years, <laughs> and I I'm I'm sure there's a word for it. Um, it might come to me at Possibly some point. Or... <laughs> it might come to me in a minute, Lynn. We'll we'll see. But this this old gray man is not pulling it up at the present time. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> I think I do. Yeah, I think they, I do. They sinned. They had a choice not to sin, but they chose to sin. Yeah. But we have no choice. Not to sin yeah. because we are sinners. Yes. And we are, and He knows that. Yes. And He knows we're going to sin. Yeah, we're stuck in that mud, and that's why God comes and pulls us out. That's right. That's why He does that. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, it's not Lynn. It's Sherry now. <laughs> Going back to Jerry's initial, you know, question, you know, why does God let this continue? Yeah. And referring to Peter. Mm. Um, all has to play out, even though he knew. He knows mm -hmm. what's going to happen, but he's also given us our instructions, what we have to do in the meantime as Christians. Don't sit and worry about it. Mm -hmm. Just let's let it play out. I know which ones are going to come to me through you, mm -hmm. who you're going to help, who you're going to help bring to me through the Holy Spirit, and we just have to play it out. Mm -hmm. But he knows that very last baby that's going to be born, mm -hmm. and it's going to be the end. So we till then, we have to play it out. Mm. We have to live our lives till then. Even mm. Jesus doesn't know mm. when the end of the world is going to be. And so we have to just live our lives accordingly to how he says to live them. 
So, so you're saying it's like when one of these uh, little schools plays Ohio State in football and you know the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't leave the stadium. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, was there? I thought I saw another hand, but maybe I missed it. Maybe there. It was, Karen was going to say something. Oh, there's hands over here now. I, <laughs> I was going to get through chapter three today, and we are almost out of time. Go ahead, Karen. Make it quick. So we're learning and growing by these experiences amid suffering mm -hmm. yeah, that we're having. Uh, Doreen, I thought your hand was up. It, it is all the, all the uh, bad things that happen. You have to look for the helpers, mm -hmm. the people that are, are doing and saving, you know, even in the wars. And mm -hmm. think of all the firemen that rushed into 9-11. Mm -hmm. And then you hear stories about, well, I was late because yeah. I was yeah. saved, and it's just a whole bunch of different things. But there are people, and I think that's God's hand in mm. helping take care of the terrible, terrible things that happen. Mm. Do you think your children and grandchildren, when they go to school this fall, do you think they'll understand all of the program and the schedule and all of that stuff that the teachers and the principals? have put into place, do you think they'll understand all of that? Yeah. Not a chance. They, they won't have a clue about all of that stuff. They'll question why things are done certain ways, right? But they aren't going to understand all of that. And I think that's like how we are in our lives as believers. We're like those children. We're watching what God's doing, and, and we can't understand it all. And we start to question, why, God? Why? Why are you doing it this way? And he has a plan. He's got purpose, doesn't he? There's something he's working out. And it's for our benefit. And he says, trust me. Trust me. That's where faith comes in, isn't it? Diane, you're getting the last word, and we're going to pray. Oh, um, <laughs> Okay. So we, so we come we come back to the scriptures and we take what God has told us and there are, there are always questions that are going to come up in our minds that we're not going to be able to answer. Sherry, when you said Adam was the first baby, Adam wasn't born like a baby. So so the big a, a question people bring up is whether Adam had a belly button or not. So <laughs> Those are things people ask, right? <laughs> and who knows and who cares, right? But, but, but this, this is the nature of the human mind, isn't it? It's, a, it's, it's the nature of the human mind to wonder and to question. And it's a part of the way God made us, isn't it? It's a part of who he made us to be, to ask questions. But we're going to end now with prayer. Let's bow our heads in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonder that is your word and also the wonder that is your will for our lives, how you guide us and direct us by your will as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and you call us to trust in you even with the things that we don't understand. Bless us now, dear Lord, as we 
as we go either to the 11 o'clock service or to our homes, guide us in your will and in your ways. And may your word find its home in our hearts, that we might be filled with that faith, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. Good discussion.